go. I'm so nervous. Me too. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN Game Scoop. I'm your host, Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week is Tina Amini. Hello, everybody. Sam Claiborne. Wow, second billing. And Tom <laughs> Marks is joining us this week. Hello. So nobody told me Tom was going to be on, so I didn't know Surprise. that have brought this bow tie. <laughs> oh. Wow. It's, this it's is embarrassing. Bow, it's tie scoop. Well, the embarrassing <laughs> thing is that I don't know how to tie them. Mm, and then like I'm wearing a shirt. Yeah, I have one of those little yeah. ones too. Little black guy that just like ties on. Black on black doesn't go. work very well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I you can't untie Tom. Just just assume it's there. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a fancy show now. Uh, <laughs> we do have a great show for you this week. We are recording this what an hour and a half before EA Play, uh, so that's the reason why we won't be talking about. Uh, Dragon Age or Mass Effect or whatever, Dead Space 4, whatever it is that EA I is about to announce. they announced Mass Effect 4. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very exciting. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, but we do have lots of exciting stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about the way certain games are handling a smart delivery type service on PS5. We're going to talk about uh, some brand new games that have just been announced and that we're playing. But first, Cyberpunk. Yes, perhaps, yes. Perhaps the most anticipated game mm. of the year has been delayed yet again. Uh, we are going to be waiting yet another two months to play this game. Delayed from September 17th to November 19th. And what's interesting about that is that will presumably be right smack dab in the middle of the releases of next-gen consoles, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. But Tom, I believe on Slack in our news uh, Slack earlier today, you were you were thinking that this might mean that the new consoles won't be out by November 19th. Is that right? Ooh. That was my gut instinct was that maybe this meant that they felt it was safe to go there because they had been talking to sony or microsoft or something this is entirely speculation that was my gut instinct but actually i think i did come around a little bit on what some other people were saying which is just mm. that they don't care <laughs> right like it probably yeah. doesn't have as much of a bearing as my initial instinct had yeah, not to steal our next topic about smart delivery, but they're one of the exceptions, actually, because that's kind of like an opt-in, opt-out feature. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think they don't care. Also, I think they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna put this out on the original console as planned, and people will inevitably buy it, and then hopefully they'll just buy it again for an upgrade at some right. point. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting that they said why they're delaying it, and the reason was mm -hmm. they wanted to add more naked robots. Yep, that's an it's official like, statement. Yeah, we <laughs> looked at the whole statement. game. And there was yeah. there are a few naked robots in there, but there they thought they could get a few more in there. Yeah, and then there's plenty of robots that are wearing clothes, and it's just really hard to redesign those robots. They just need to build <laughs> models from scratch to have them be naked robots. This is why you need a variety of assets right from the get-go. Yeah, <laughs> variety of asses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I don't know. It's interesting. Like, uh, if, if if this is like a week or two after the release of one or both uh, consoles, it's just like an interesting time. Like, like Cyberpunk is probably, like I said, the most anticipated game of the year because it's a multi-platform. Of course, PlayStation Four owners are excited about The Last of Us Part Two, but only those gamers are going to be playing that one. So it's like it's it's conceivable that it could overshadow the release of these new consoles. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. if there's nothing, no game of that caliber. You know, but that's there, we already know. We already know there's Assassin's Creed also, so that's right. just another there's big that. thing. It's not as big, but that's like the big reason to play things on next gen. So that exists. But even even Assassin's Creed Valhalla, like what we've seen of Valhalla so far, doesn't necessarily like blow me away visually or conceptually at, on the level of like a. Uh, uh, cyberpunk right like of at least what we've seen of cyberpunk so far we've, like cyberpunk we've seen is, no gameplay <laughs> well we've seen technically like two hours but it's been at like e3s over know, the last three years we've definitely oh, seen yes. cyberpunk yeah gameplay. cyberpunk gameplay is awesome I've, i watched somebody yeah. play that with a controller which is a big big difference than what we've seen from assassin's creed yeah so like it's 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 gonna be interesting to see because i think if there was a game that could be in the middle of console launches and sort of still compete with whatever those launch games is cyberpunk seems like the game to do it right because even in a, a console launch year everyone is still excited for cyberpunk and everyone is still like anticipating that game yeah for sure yeah even with simultaneous conversations about inevitably like you know the speed of this game versus this or the features or the ui or whatever it is that'll inevitably be part of that initial conversation um the initial 
launch is always going to be a little bit softer than like well into a console's life cycle where mm-hmm. you're just going to have tons of games and like really see this thing fleshed out. So there will be some conversation, but I imagine a lot of the uh, discourse, capital D, will be around Cyberpunk mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. I, thing is- I, know, I think we'll all be playing Cyberpunk to the point in which we are switching consoles. Like I know we're going to talk about that as, as we've all mentioned now, but you know, it'll be interesting the day where I'm like, now my save is going to be on my Xbox. You know, I think that's really cool. Well, it's better for Xbox than PlayStation, right? Cause like, if you've already got your new console, you can play cyberpunk on your Xbox one because it's backwards mm-hmm. compatible, mm-hmm. but the same won't be true necessarily for PlayStation five. Uh, so it's possible you would have to have both your PS5 and your PS4 set up if you want to play Cyberpunk on PlayStation, right? I think that's unclear at this point. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, a little bit. They have more of the, um, as like a company, they have more of the sentiment of this is the PS5, this is its ecosystem. We want to move forward in this direction. Whereas Xbox is going more like like an Apple model where it's like, here's mm-hmm. where we are housing all of our um, like all of our software and you can kind of upgrade as needed, but it's not necessary either. So it's different CD philosophies. Project, it's absolutely true. And if CD Projekt wanted to just do whatever they want with their saves, I, I suppose they could, right? If they, could, if they just made a system that said like, oh yeah, you can just transfer your save onto PS5, I think we'd be fine mm-hmm. there. Yeah, but, I mean, you yeah. can. Yeah. There, are, there are games that let you transfer saves from, like, Divinity Original Sin 2 lets you transfer your save from mm. Steam to Switch, right? Like, the jump from PS4 to PS5 is uh, certainly conceivable. <laughs> yeah. That is the weirdest save jump that I could conceive of, actually. So, yeah. if that's, been, if that's been done. That's like cross play to anything Switch. I'm just like, wow, they allowed that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> well, In any case, we'll learn more about Cyberpunk on uh, June 25th. That's when they're uh, having their Night City Wire event. And then actually IGN will have a preview of Cyberpunk going up immediately afterwards. So please be excited for that. Uh, A pre-show and a post-show with at least one familiar face, apparently. (laughs) Apparently I'm on the pre-show, post-show. Sorry, Tom. Yes. We're covering a lot of Cyberpunk stuff next week. and That's the coolest thing. All these purple backgrounds are going to come in handy. Yeah, finally, it's, it's fitting with the aesthetic. We've been building towards this moment yeah. this whole time. <laughs> um, okay, so speaking of PS5 and uh, the, the PS5's lack of a smart delivery feature uh, officially like Xbox has, we found out this week that Madden NFL, on, Madden NFL 21 on PS5 is EA is going to be offering its own equivalent to smart delivery. Um, it's sending an offer to upgrade I actually I the one. I guess they're not actually using smart delivery on Xbox One. Basically, they're offering an upgrade from Xbox One or PS4 version of the game to an Xbox Series X or PS5 version if you buy the current gen version of the game before the release of Madden 22 next year. You'll automatically be upgraded to the next gen equivalent version with all the extra enhancements for next gen. And they call this system dual. You're hurting Tom. You're hurting Tom. Visibly. <laughs> He's hurting. They call the system dual entitlement. Which is just the perfect name for something for gamers. <laughs> That's a joke, uh, people listening, that That's we're making about ourselves. So, yep. so don't get mad. Settle down. Um, yeah, I mean, I get that the concept has been like hassle free, right? Like you, you're you're entitled to this game because you've purchased it and it's like within the release scope of a next gen console. But man, there's so much you have to keep track of and so much at play here. So it's. You know, like you have to think uh, about what is the differentiations between the two consoles in terms of what are Sony's rules, what are Xbox's rules, Mm -hmm. which seem to be a little bit more flexible. And then what are like EA's rules that are cooperating with that or not cooperating with that. So it's just so much to keep track of. Um, And EA in particular, or rather uh, for Madden, like they have um, that specific date that like is an additional rule you've got to remember and abide by just Mm -hmm. to like know how to use the system. And another rule is that uh, physical discs can't mm-hmm. be used for upgrade to a discless console. Yep, exactly. So if, you, if you buy the disc and then you end up getting the uh, the digital PlayStation 5, no entitlement. So we haven't <laughs> seen if there's going to be a discless version of the Xbox still, because that's still the, the rumored, unannounced yeah. rumored thing. Or, or even if it's like a lesser system, if it has a disc. Um, but it is funny to see, like, just kind of messaging-wise, that Xbox learned 
from that PS4 uh, uh, slash Xbox One announcement at E3, where mm-hmm. you know they did all their stuff like, if you want to share, you have to do this, 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 and this, and you can have these <laughs> groups of people, and you know this is your family group, and this is your friend group, yeah. and then and PlayStation's like walks on, they're like, this is how you share games, here's a game, you know, and now <laughs> and now they're do the Xbox did that, they just kind of like yeah, Microsoft, like, oh, if you want to play your games on anything, it doesn't matter, a PC, sure, yeah, but just yeah, just I buy know. it once. Although considering we've been watching so many speed runs lately because we've been running those as ch- uh, charity mm-hmm. streams on on Summer of Gaming, I was starting to think like, so on Xbox, it'll automatically detect what console you're on and then load that version of the game uh, digitally. So if you're on the uh, Series X, they'll be able to load that Series X, like enhanced version. But like, what if speedrunners don't want enhancements mm-hmm. and they get in the way of mm-hmm. like certain glitches that they use and they want to specifically run the, you know, uh, less enhanced version, the like Xbox One version? Um, it's, it's interesting. I'm curious to see how that's actually going to unfold. That's and how then, if it has any implications. Speedrunners always exploit things that are patched. So like mm-hmm. it's already hard to find probably like, you know, the the 1.0.1 version of things that people were like really enjoying speedrunning. And then they patch it. And it's like, unless you have that on a thing that you never update again, you're never going to be able to play yeah. it. Like people sort like find copies of Nintendo 64 cartridges with earlier versions of the games on them before things are patched so they can break them more. I know Ocarina of Time is one of those. That's a, that's really interesting. And that happens already a lot in speedrunning too, where like developers especially with games that are early access or updated frequently by the developers they'll the community will keep track of patches versions of the game that they like because they have a certain bug or they are missing a certain thing and the community will just sort of at that point you know because you're not really you're playing the game in such a different way it doesn't really matter specifically what version you're on so they just all rally around one version and they say okay this is the kind of community picked favorite speedrunning game so yeah it'll be interesting with that that sort of thing already uh, or, or auto updating but they've found ways to get around it this gen so they'll find ways to get around it next gen i'm sure <laughs> It's for historians to figure out too, right? Because like right. each version of a game is like precious, right? You know, like all those things that were patched out could be historically interesting glitches and stuff like that. I think that's really funny and kind of yeah. sad. Sorry, we won't be able to preserve right. that stuff. It's interesting to think, you know, someday, many years down the road, uh, game preservation, being able to revisit, you know, a game, revisit all of the different patches that were released. Uh, yeah, and if you over, think about it this years, way, the reviews of games that we write are really important and they're historically important. And they're, you know, you look up Wikipedia, there's oh, there's an IGN score. It says who reviewed it, all that stuff. That, that review of that product is instantly outdated when there's a major update or something like that. So like, Mm -hmm. unless we re-review something, there's a disconnect there. So there's this, there, the historical record of how things were viewed when they are out. And then maybe how you could like dip back in and play again are like not, there, there's no parity there. I think that's really interesting. And man, if you was, if I was in college right now, that's what I'd study. <laughs> cool. Um, cool. Anyway, there's very few games that are sort of making this commitment for PlayStation uh, gamers. Uh, where you know this dual entitlement thing. I think Destiny Two is a is an exception. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if more and more publishers sort of come up with their own fix for this, since Sony isn't providing just an overall blanket backwards compatibility um last week on the show we were talking about the ps5 showcase last week and we talked briefly about how i thought it was a little bit odd that they opened up their future of gaming show with gta 5 (laughs) Uh, (laughs) and of course uh uh they introduced a program where i think every month PS4 gamers are getting like a million dollars of in-game currency in GTA 5 online until the launch of the PS5 version of GTA 5 in 2021. And PS Plus subscribers will also get GTA online for free for PS5 when that's ready. Um, Anyway, gamesindustry.biz ran an op-ed this week claiming that GTA 5 is actually the PS5's killer app. And I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Of course, GTA 5 one of the biggest pieces of entertainment ever produced by human beings. Uh, And the op-ed on gamesindustry.biz said, PlayStation has immediately made a play for the GTA audience, and it's doing it in two stages. The first is making a significant amount of in-game currency available to PS4 owners every month until the PS5 version of the game launches in 2021. Then once that offer ends, PS5 owners are able to claim a free version of Grand Theft Auto Online, as long as they do so within the first three months of launch. 
It's a crucial move in Sony's mission to get players to upgrade to its new console quickly. Uh, so I just I thought that was actually pretty interesting. It's like yeah, there's no game bigger than GTA Five, and you have like a little bit of an incentive to get your uh, you know PS Five, you know, purchase it within the first three months that it's available. Mm -hmm. Catch up to the online community because that's one of the most obnoxious yeah. things possible is to like enter in. You're just getting your bearings, even though there yeah. is like an opening world level um to that game but regardless it's like it does help the incentive there too to where you would be able to catch up reasonably so so you actually want to maybe play the game but yeah it makes sense i mean it's a fair point it's not super exciting for us because we're constantly watching the news so it's mm -hmm. not the most exciting announcement it's like oh skyrim's on another platform like great mm -hmm. sounds good played yeah. that game for 100 hours already like you know not expecting to play it again on my switch but I think there's probably like a bigger, more mainstream audience where it is appealing if they're going to get a new console. Like I think about my brothers, they don't play all the time, but if they can play GTA five, if they haven't before, why not get it on PS five? Well, mm -hmm. also, also the, my mind jumps to the people who only really play GTA online, right? Where if that's yeah. their only game, just saying, Hey, if you get a PS five, you just get it right. You don't have yeah. to rebuy this thing. You can just bring it on over is is really significant because if you're just only playing that game, then the barrier of entry is, you know, it's not lowered by a ton of money, but it's just lower. Yeah. It's just saying, yeah, yeah, this will be here for you when, when you, when you come. I think maybe Sony knows something that we don't about how many people play GTA online on their platform. Uh, we, we see how many people play GTA online. It's a huge community. It's not one that's discussed as much as say Fortnite or, you know, when PUBG was bigger and, and Call of Duty and stuff like that. But man, it's massive and it's cross-platform. But not all those communities are on PlayStation. And right. I wonder if the PlayStation 4's like go-to big gaming community that just has constant people on it is it might just be GTA 5. Yeah. So that's their move. Yeah, that's like an inherent player base. Why not why not scoop that up before anyone else does? Yeah. I do know I know my GTA 5 codes on a PlayStation controller innately. But I don't know them on a on an Xbox controller. That's what did it. That was what the final signature went down, knowing that information. <laughs> yeah, and we've we've mentioned this several times on the show. Um, but if it happens to be a slow news day for IGN, then the GTA Five cheats and wikis page will be the most popular thing on IGN on any given slow news day. Only mm -hmm. for five years now. Yeah, only. For five <laughs> yeah. Years now. Um, I love this last paragraph of this uh, gamesindustry.biz uh, article was very interesting. It said, in an industry where games, have where games have become their own ecosystems, this generational shift will prove more complicated than before. You're not just asking gamers to put down the consoles they've been playing, but the games they've been living in, too. As a result, we should expect the big console games of tomorrow to look an awful lot like the big console games of yesterday. And uh, It's interesting to think that as games as a service... Uh, if if they just sort of end up spanning console generations, you know, if if GTA Five mm -hmm. and Fortnite and uh, Apex Legends are the most popular games on PlayStation Four today, Destiny Two will they also be the most popular games on PlayStation Five? It's just yeah. interesting to think about. Yeah, that was the big debate around Destiny One to Destiny Two, where a lot of people didn't want to make like a sequel progression because it's like, well, I've been existing in this game, can't you just support this game? And I think right. Bungie probably thinks about things a little differently now as they're thinking about Destiny Two. So it's kind of like, as exactly as the Game Industry Biz article says, it's like taking that ecosystem and moving it forward. Like I imagine when I used to be hardcore into World of Warcraft, what if like. I had to upgrade my PC, but they're like, sorry, you know, here's World of Warcraft 2. It's like, I don't know if I want to, you know, reset all that. Maybe I'll just have my older PC over here and still play this game where I've formulated a guild and like I have a built up player, um, a built up character or two or three. Uh, so why would I make that transition if I'm not I ready think to? The, uh, the exact like worst case scenario happened to Xbox last time where. Uh, they didn't make it possible to move your Halo 2, Halo 3 uh, communities between those systems. Like, mm. th they had the biggest online multiplayer game sometimes with the Halo games, and th they did that. They did, like, Halo you know, 4 or 5, you know, like, instead of doing... Uh, and back then, they did ODST and Reach and all this other stuff. Yeah. Like, they never, they never made it easy for that community to stay in one place and just play forever, mm. and um, whether it was across consoles or across discs. And now, like, Halo's not the big multiplayer game. Like I would have never predicted that 10 years ago. I would have thought like Halo is never going away because it's still just so fun and so perfect as an online game. It just, it fractured the community every way that it could. 
Yeah. That's why I'm interested to see if Halo Infinite can be like a system seller mm -hmm. for the Series mm -hmm. X. Because you're right, it's just it just isn't the uh uh you know popular shooter that it used to be, you know. Here's what they need to do. They put it out now on Xbox uh, yeah. uh one, right? And then they give you a bunch of GTA money for yep. the next four months. Yep. yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and, then, and then you we, you're gonna you know clearly be able to have fun playing that when it comes out. All yep. roads lead back to GTA five. <laughs> GTA money. <laughs> GTA money. That's true. Uh, okay, moving on. We got confirmation this week that the last remaining uh, video game event of the year that hadn't been canceled, uh, PAX West, uh, is now officially canceled. Not, not a big surprise. Everyone expected that. Uh, I'm not sure why they waited so long. Um, but that's it. Now there are no more... There's no Gamescom. There's no uh, TGS. There are no more video game uh, live events in 2020. Instead, PAX West is being replaced with PAX Online, which I think is nine days long. I think that sounds pretty crazy. Well, as, somebody, Great. as we just put out like a month long, yeah. uh, I, think that, <laughs> I feel like that's nothing. Yeah, I, don't know, I don't know if PAX, if uh, the PAX organization knows what they're getting into. Uh, <laughs> nine days of live content. Um, and I, I know not, you know not everyone goes to PAX, but I think it's significant because 60,000 people do go to PAX and they get hands-on with some of the biggest upcoming mm -hmm. games, like it could have been Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, yeah. And then they go out into the world and they evangelize, they do the marketing for uh, a lot of these publishers and they tell people about what they played and what they liked. So yeah, but it's you're fairly just significant. Yeah, a big metaphor for viral spread right now, too. Well, that's <laughs> actually true. They also would do that. <laughs> There's literally, it, literally, they called it the Pax Pox, right? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like oh, yeah. the, the yeah. sickness you'd catch from going to the show. This yeah. is also funny to me just because it's the last one, it's the last domino to fall, but it was also the last domino standing because PAX East was like mm. the final big event that happened before we everything there. started shutting down. Yeah. We were there, yeah. Sam and Tina. Yeah. yeah. And they had uh, really good hand sanitizer stations everywhere and uh, people did a pretty good job. That was before anybody was wearing masks or anything though. Like oh, it yeah. was right. like everybody was surface based. Cons concern yeah you know? yeah and considering all this broke out technically in like november december it, mm -hmm. i'm shocked that something more yeah. didn't come out of that event um yeah, very know. fortunate obviously that mm -hmm. nothing happened to us too but yeah. uh i do distinctly remember that being like the last trip i took in general oh, yeah. um oh, yeah. but the last like big like in-person event that we attended to um so i, I remember it wistfully <laughs> Like, yeah, that was... that's yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, one of the last few restaurant outings. <laughs> <laughs> like, things hit so quickly right after PAX. Yeah. Um, yeah. This year's PAX, so it's nine days of live programming. I think that us four can it's fill free. one of those days. It's yeah. free. <laughs> can we that's still the, get a game? That's the big point. Yeah. Can we still yeah, get a game panel all day? I think we can. Then? Yeah. We'll see. Okay. We'll um, get a game scoop panel on PAX. There on you go. I, I do like that. Okay, so the the benefits, the silver lining to this is that um, a, it has a better global reach because a lot of mm -hmm. people, you know, for a variety of reasons, can't attend one of these events, whether it's cost, whether it's a, you know, country to country visa, whatever restrictions. Um, so it effectively makes it a little bit more global and lifts the restrictions from having to pay for the event too, uh, and then being limited by passes. So gone are scalpers, um, and you know, people oh, yeah. like more people can participate now instead of. Because if anyone's ever tried to buy a PAX Pass, it's like gone in 30 seconds. It's it's yeah. very um, first come, first serve uh, and out very quickly. So that part is kind of nice. Yeah, and we, sure. If we were to have gone this year, the one thing that I will miss above all was the cool vintage shops and how there was like cool old games to buy everywhere. And we had a really yeah. fun day going from shop to shop and uh, we all picked up some cool stuff, which is just sitting in the office unplayed because I was like on the toy <laughs> pile that's when true. we all scattered. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's true. true. Um, okay, so... Tell me, what did you, I want to know what your gut tells you. Uh, PAX East 2021 is currently supposed to kick off on March 25th. March. Will that happen? I say it's not going to happen. Really? Yeah. Three months my, into domestic. three months into 2021. So initial projections were like, okay, 2021 is going to be when things start to open up again. But man, did we throw that out the window and got got very tired of quarantine and decided, you know, to yeah. to start abandoning that. Um, obviously some of, some of the reasoning behind that being very legitimate, uh, in terms of the economy and impact there, but, uh, it's definitely going to delay, uh, in terms of like, we're going to have to go through that all over again, once that spreads. And I'm in Texas currently, um, where we've shot up in the last few weeks, quite a bit in terms of cases. So I have to imagine we're going through this, uh, all over again in a few months. 
Yeah, and we don't need to we don't need to dwell on this, but uh, I do think people are going to be very very resistant to going on lockdown again. So it'll be interesting to see mm. what happens. That's true. Yeah, it's totally that dependent occurs. on organizers if they want to kind of follow suit there. I think it would be. It, I feel like I'm projecting that in that time frame, that's going to be what the responsible thing to do is. But uh, we all haven't been necessarily behaving responsibly with it. So who knows what the decisions will be. Well, we'll see if PAX East 2021 ends up being canceled. Uh, it's too cold anyway. I mean, it is very cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seattle. <laughs> yeah. I would refer to, let's do PAX East in Seattle. Then I consider. And then PAX West in Boston. <laughs> yeah. 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 That makes sense. But this is, this is smart delivery fine print levels now. <laughs> <laughs> we could just do PAX East in Kansas City because it is east of California. There you go. Yeah. And, and yeah. Kansas City is nice in March. Plus, nice you could do PAX East in Kansas City, Missouri, and PAX West in Kansas City, Kansas. Exactly. Did I get that right? Exactly. I got that right. Yep, yes. that's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, in happier news, email. <laughs> in happier news, uh, Tom, I know you uh, follow a lot of indie games. Or have you have your eye on Carrion? Yeah. That game I'm looks super, wild. Yeah, I'm super excited for that game. And we just got confirmation this week. That it is coming to Switch along with PC and Xbox. No PS4 version announced at this time, which is a little odd. Hmm. Um, but that game looks awesome. This is the reverse horror game. Uh, this is the official description of Carrion. Did you a come reverse, up horror... reverse horror? No, I said okay. this is the official. A reverse horror game in which you assume the role of an amorphous creature of unknown origins, stalking and consuming those that imprisoned you. And I have a very damey feeling about this one. <laughs> damey feeling about it too. It looks fun. I and it's reverse it's, horror because you're the monster. So it yeah. makes sense. Yeah, you're I like don't... this horrible Cronenbergian mass of yeah. meat just like consuming people. It's really terrifying. Yeah, it's like... It's, gonna, the, it's too late now for this joke, but I'm going to say it anyway. But I was going to say, like, I'm really glad to see that Nintendo is really supporting the family-friendly experience just given, like, their last few conferences. <laughs> is it too soon for this joke? Is this, is this just uh, inside played backwards? I was, <laughs> I was thinking that too. Spoilers, geez. Yeah, I too soon for this joke. I I don't know. I don't. Know yeah, well, to be fair, with the collector's edition oh, stuff, right. you know, being a thing, not to spoil yeah. it more, but I was totally yeah. thinking the same thing. It, it's like a sequel. It picks up after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, so then we know it's not of unknown origins at all. We know exactly. Yeah, what that's true. Um, I like how it uh, it it's not just like you know gore hound stuff for you damon but it's also pixelated it's like it's yeah. like it's a really cool art style too yeah um what do you do in it is it like a metroidvania or is it like exploration based or is it just killing stuff is it a i well yeah i think you have to like you know find your way out of this laboratory or whatever but i think you're growing as you're consuming people snake yeah and then also if you get like snake? hit is that snake yeah, basically. The classic, the classic game. Yeah. You know, snake. You play the snake. You <laughs> eat color. Ramming meat through hallways. It gets yeah. longer and longer. It yeah. really does look like that because you're like navigating through these like pathways, um, and yeah. you're effectively eating things along the way, and you do grow. So yeah. You, you go from a hamburger to a sausage, then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In anyway. the terminology, what yeah, were you going to say, Tom? No, it's just like I was gonna compare it functionally, and I don't think it's actually structurally like this, but like like Katana Zero, if you guys played that, yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's a similar sort of gameplay loop of oh. like here's a room full of enemies, figure mm. out how to navigate it without getting torn apart. Except you're not like one hit kill, so it's mm, it's yeah. slightly different, but it's a similar sort of like core. And Can you're remember? doing the tearing apart. Yes, <laughs> it reminds me of uh, uh, of uh, Super Meat Boy. If Super Meat Boy is the Lego version, and this is the Duplo version. <laughs> it's basically the gritty reboot of Super Meat Boy. <laughs> yep. Um, but and then so speaking of Nintendo Switch, um, but something that uh is, is definitely not a, a gory uh gritty reboot of anything is Jump Rope Challenge, which was released this week for free. And Sam's was, response was, thanks, I hate it. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> well it, first of all, please. it is gritty. I love bunnies. <laughs> That's the plan. I love bunnies. And it's you true. know, if you jump 100 times on the first day, it shows a photo of a cat. That's yeah. a real part. 
Yeah. It's not like it's, it's not like, oh, this look at this cool great. drawing that somebody did. It's just a clip art photo of a, a really <laughs> cute gray and white cat. Yeah. And it just appears great. there and nothing else happens. You jump a hundred times, the cat appears. See you tomorrow. What's the hate? The game. <laughs> yeah. Well, Seems like a good goal, it, motivating goal. Look, I I I I enjoy the uh the sport and the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i've no i don't really know how to jump rope uh I, I mean i do from like being a little kid but like i don't know how to jump rope with an invisible jump rope and it makes no sense like the bunny's just hopping up and down and making noises and i'm like i don't think the invisible jump rope went under me yet i don't know where my <laughs> hands are supposed to be when, uh, where the rope is because it's kind of like disconnect it's so confusing but what's bad about it is that after jumping 100 times on your house you just feel terrible i think that's the point <laughs> Because you yeah. got exercise? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a different type of exercise. It's this kind of like bummer. I just jumped 100 times in my house exercise. Go outside. You can do it right outside on your front porch. That's true. What was the the switch. Switch. Oh, you, I could go on the roof of my friend's apartment, and they could all crowd around and watch me do it. Yeah, like yeah the, you could be the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And then you can put up a YouTube tutorial of how to jump rope right next to it, so maybe you would advance your game as you go on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I want my money back. Also, uh, I think You're it's free really money. Yeah, I think it's really funny that uh, that they they're putting out games just for Switch owners because the Switch Lite has been like that's all that's been available for like three months now. <laughs> yeah, ironically, is. this is a yeah. game you can't play with the Switch Lite. So you there you go. Play it. Yeah, you need those Joy Cons, and you can't play with a Pro Controller either. It specifies. Well, yeah, I imagine so. It's an imaginary <laughs> jump rope. Who cares? <laughs> you just controls. The jump, the bunny could just say jump a hundred times, and then you'd be fine playing it. The it motion controls don't do anything. Track. They're still terrible. They have not fixed motion controls. They're so bad. Seriously, if this bunny is like half jumping. I'm like, I swear, I was really thinking in my brain. Okay, invisible jump ropes coming down right now, and then when I jump, I try to get in the flow, and the bunny's just like whoop, 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 Okay, so whoop. for next week's episode, you need to just take the Joy-Con while you're sitting and just rotate it around in your hand and see what happens if you can game the system. See how mm -hmm. to test those motion controls properly, and it's then so give really us a report. Idea. I mean, yeah. I could just be doing it right now. I could be giving my exercise right now on GameScoop, and then I True. don't have to do it later. Um, when when the uh, Nintendo came out, I, I got mine with a, the Power Pad, which was a big sheet of plastic that you put on the ground, and you play a game called World Class Track Meet. And mm -hmm. two people could get on this big sheet of plastic, and they would there's big buttons on it for your feet, so you could run in place. And when you ran in place, your character would go fast, and then you'd like jump, and then your character would jump because it would know there's no feet there. So you could do this this thing, but immediately what you did that was you know Christmas morning or whatever, uh, on uh, the Boxing Day after Christmas. Thing, that's a shout out to CJ. It's a Canada reference. Uh, you could just get on your your knees and hit it with your hands like this, <laughs> and you'd go so fast. <laughs> and that's where they came up with the idea for Donkey Konga, I think. Yeah, seriously, yeah. true. Also, good exercise. I do like that people are thinking about games that are fitting in the quarantine, though. That that part's nice. Feels feels yeah. relevant. Feels like they're thinking oh, yeah. of people. This is this oh, is the two this... game at the same time. Oh yeah, the Pokemon smile. But oh, this yeah. is this jump rope game is so funny to me because this is a like first party Nintendo game, right? Like mm -hmm. this is some Nintendo developers who were just like trapped at home and wanted to make something for funsies, and they gave it away for free. Like it's so mm -hmm. it's so weird and quirky that that is a thing that Nintendo is so like is suddenly cool with putting out where i i see them as such a reserved company traditionally and now they're just yeah. like nah sure free kind of slapdash but great little jump yeah. rope game I not that cool there's it. much risk in like cute artsy little bunnies though <laughs> that's right, in exactly. with nintendo <laughs> yeah. i'm yeah. hoping that there's some like really in-depth you know crazy thing that starts developing in this game so it's like <laughs> you know after like you do this for long enough all of a sudden there's like some other mini game that opens up and then all of a sudden you're in some kind of dungeon and your, your bunny's trapped and then like you have to go save the bunny like that's what i'm hoping for but i suspect tomorrow will be a puppy picture this this is the prequel to carry it what you want <laughs> yeah exactly this is the origin story <laughs> It gets real dark in the end there, but you're fit at the same time, so it's okay. Yeah, if, if tomorrow the image they unlock is a clip art of like raw meat, we'll know. There you go. Mm -hmm. It's evolving into Super Meat Boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we know Paper Mario is coming up in a in a month. Woo! But other than that, Nintendo has been very quiet, which is strange for the month when E3 Damn it, usually you're just, happens. 
you're blocking out Pokemon announcements again. You always do this. There's Pokemon Animal Snap. Pokemon. Okay, There's there Pokemon we go. Snap. You heard yeah. about it. You heard about it. Okay. It's it's that's fine. It's fine. It's a big deal game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I just wonder, like, what? Well, so, like, if if E3 had happened, what would Nintendo have been showing? Would it have been Pokemon Snap? Yeah, I thought it would have been. That, yeah, that would have been their big game. That's it. No, I don't think it's their big game. I think it were like every two days they're revealing a game now, so if, they probably have E3, a big. Game. If E3 had happened, we would have already gotten the Arms character for Smash Bros. Would have been out. We would have gotten the Pokemon Snap announcement there. We would have gotten the Paper Mario announcement there. And probably more, we probably would have seen Breath of the Wild 2 or whatever that is, right? The bunnies would have been released for Smash as well, right? The jumping bunnies. Sure, sure. Um, we uh, we um, would have seen presumably a giant Mario celebration thing, which I'm sure would have been the theme of their booth, if not Pokemon Snap. If Pokemon Snap was the theme of their booth, that would have been really cool. <laughs> yeah, but to be fair, they did have some of that stuff leak, so it has, I think, some to do with that too, where some of that was spoiled earlier than they intended. Yeah. Well, where are these Mario remasters? Mm. Are they That's real? a great question. Is this I hope they're thing? not on 3DS. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you have to. Yeah, I bet you unlock them with Jump Rope Challenge. If you jump yeah. like enough for enough days in a row, it unlocks the Mario remasters. Here, I'm gonna just keep talking about Pokemon. In the background of the uh, video, they had uh, it, they they showed the Gold and Silver era Pokemon all lined up, and so the theory is that there's also a Let's Go for Gold and Silver. That Let's Go is that kind of uh, the remake of the first game that they did a couple years ago is the first Switch Pokemon game. I thought that was pretty cool. Mm. So they would might have had that might have that too. Like I just want like a direct that's the bigger replacement of the E3 direct, yeah. but I don't yeah. know if we're gonna get that. Yeah, there hasn't been anything this month. Like I said, um, to be fair, a lot of publishers have pushed um, some of their stuff out, uh, like mm. Ubisoft, for instance, to July. So I think. We need to wait until July and see if Nintendo does anything bigger than before we completely count them out from like the E3 recovery uh, showcase mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. I think they have a yeah. huge amount of really cool games this fall. Like they just always do. That's like the nature of Switch right now. I just can't wait to hear about them. Same. Okay, let's talk about what we've been playing. And I believe at least Sam and Tina have been playing a hot new video game. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Tom has been playing as well. Tolo 2? Yeah. Are, are you playing, Tom? No. Okay. Uh, it's I the game it. that we all need right now. A real feel-good <laughs> romp through a uh, murderous post-apocalyptic uh, quarantine zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For real. It's brutal, man. It's not a good feeling game, and it's not meant to be, and that's fine. I think that's a good thing for people that are looking for that. It's like Breaking Bad. It's like really, really cool, high-quality drama and there's a lot to it, and I can't wait to go play it again, but I also, like, have to look away a lot, and mm. I also don't like any of the characters. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't think I'm as far uh, as Sam is, so I'm a little bit earlier on, and, and honestly, it was because, Samus? like, at first... Sorry? Oh, Sam, Sam? <laughs> no. Um, I think it's because, like, I, I first picked it up, and I could really only play for five minutes uh, before I was like, I'm just, I'm really not in the mood for this right now, mm. like... Post long day at work and, and dealing, you know, with the realities of the world and whatnot, you kind of want a reprieve um, and a breather. So, uh, like, frankly, something like SpongeBob Rehydrated is like top of mind because it's like goofy and fun and you can kind of let off some steam uh, with that, as opposed to uh, The Last of Us, where I'm a heavy stealth player. I mean, I think predominantly you're supposed to play stealth, but I like obsessively play that way. Like I'll reload if I if I disturb a clicker accidentally. I don't want to waste mm -hmm. ammunition, you know. Yep. So um, that makes it so tense. So even if it has nothing to do with the quarantine and has nothing to do with the circumstances of this post-apocalyptic narrative element, like even if that stuff uh, doesn't bug you, it's just the the concept of sitting and kind of like breathing heavier while you're waiting to go around corners and then you've mm -hmm. like accidentally miscalculated one of the clicker routes and you get yeah. in, into contact with them. So it's like heavy moments like that. Um, so I've been churning through it slowly, uh, but so far it's, it's been a lot of um, The Last of Us plus some jumping uh, and some new characters. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Um, yeah. there's a, uh, I'm about 20 hours in. I, I've played like wow. one 14 hour day. I've been playing a couple hours after wow. work every day. So uh, I'm really far and um, it, it, it's it's all those things. I want to say some good things about it. Uh, Naughty Dog is like an unbelievable 
uh, uh, studio. The, the, the craftsmanship that, that goes into things that they care about. Uh, there's like a guitar in the game that you pick up from time to time and you can play chords in it. And like the fingering is unbelievable. Like each string mm. is bent and the, the chords are perfect. And then you can strum by hitting the pad on the controller and like the picking sounds like that kind of stuff is amazing. Every face, every hand, every blade of grass, every like, you know, moss covered old car is like so so cool in that game you go to places that are like things you would like to see in the post apocalypse that are overgrown because they'll be beautiful then like you know i don't want to say any of them but uh, you get to see stuff like that a lot so that's the the good thing that they have the the gameplay side of it is the good parts are exactly what tina's talking about they're tense you know uh sneaking around parts that you want to reset and get just right like i love that stuff in games but uh, again like it's not it's not the best time to, for me to be playing that right now because then at the end of that there's like a lot of neck stabbing and shouting but um, there's a uh, there's there's an element to this game which I also is kind of in the past, and that's that you're doing a lot of triangle searches where all you're doing in a giant beautiful area is is kind of going up against invisible walls and trying to find the triangle that allows you to hit the triangle button and then mm. climb up to something, or hit the triangle button and lift something, or hit the triangle button and and interact with the environment. So it's like where where the climb everything stuff that we're talking about is saying like oh you can build a, 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 an amazing environment an amazing game and then you can climb everything and explore this is not what that is this is this is like these channels that you go through and it's you know at the end of them is, is narrative and, and during them is cool dialogue and stuff like that it's just such a weird it's just uncharted still like it's crazy mm -hmm. to be playing uncharted still but like super serious and really pretty <laughs> And I don't know. It's just like it's such a weird game. I, yeah. I I'm so impressed though. Like I I mean like the people making games right now or graphics alone, they're just there's it's incomparable. They're just amazing. Two quick things about that. One, at the very least, for loot, they give you a little bit of a heads up earlier than like you don't have to be pressed up against uh, a cabinet to know that you can open That's it true. for loot. Like they'll signal you a little bit earlier. So I appreciate not having to obsessively go to every corner looking for yeah. loot because I'll, I'll do that anyway. Yeah, exactly. I make sure I loop around a thousand times and people are like, what are you doing? Can we get along now? And I'm yeah. like, no, I must search every corner. Um, but the second thing was what you just touched on in terms of there being dialogue. So while you do have to look around for like, where's the ladder? Where can I jump to? A, they're meant to be a little bit more puzzle oriented as far as I've seen so far, which is neat. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily smart yet. Uh, Jonathan in our official review loved the environmental puzzle stuff. So I think I just need to like develop a little bit more in the gameplay uh, to see some of the extended stuff as like we get through the tutorial areas or as I get through the tutorial areas. Um, but in the midst of all of that is that classic la original Last of Us element of, okay, we're going to carry you through those moment, those gameplay moments um, that normally would be quiet with really interesting dialogue that extends the story, extends your relationship with people, extends your understanding of even yourself as your own character too. So I like that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what Naughty Dog's good at. Tom, do you plan on playing The Last of Us Part Two? Yes. I, uh, I actually played through the first one for the first time about a month ago, a little over a month ago, in anticipation of this. And cool. it's funny hearing you guys talking about it because... I'm excited to play it and all the stuff about like it being hard to play through and not like an enjoyable thing, even if it's like, or not fun outright is like exactly why I didn't play the last of us one when it first came out, yeah. when it, when, when last was one first came out, I played probably like three hours of it. And I was like, this is just making me sad. And I just like stopped yeah. playing it as a result. So like, yeah, I'm I'm excited to go to the second one, and I I'm kind of have my expectations set that that's what it's already going to be. Um, nice. Not that you guys didn't just saying like I, I I know what I'm getting into, I guess, and I'm like I'm looking forward to to that sort of experience. Yeah, I I have to think about this a lot. Like I, again, Breaking Bad is my best example from last year, mm -hmm. but a movie has to hit like a really high level of people saying. Like you have to see this in the theater for me to go see like a dramatic movie in the theater versus a sci-fi movie or a, or a comedy or something because mm -hmm. it's that that full experience. I I don't know. I'd rather take that in and it, I like I like reading. I like I like doing that in, in novel form a lot more. But like some something about some things that are, are dramatic have lots of violence and and I just I take themselves really seriously are like not they're not supposed to be fun. But I also don't need to consume them. Like I just mm -hmm. I can I can just skip that. And uh, I don't feel that way about this game because the craftsmanship, like Breaking Bad, is so, so high level. And I just kind of want to see what what people can make in games. And this is 
this is a showcase for like what the best developers on earth can make right now. So mm. I just want to see that. And it's, it's totally worth the journey for that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm in a little bit of a uh, pickle because I never finished the first one and I need to figure out the best way to prepare myself for two. Like, do I just read you know the what? plot synopsis? Do I watch the cutscenes? I don't know. Uh, this do you have a save? Damon, yeah, do you have a save? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I played it on my PS4, but like, r just realistically, I'm not gonna like finish that yeah. first, you know. Fair enough. It's just I, such I think... a good game, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this game does a recap of it in, oh, in a okay. really creative way later in the game, and so okay. the standalone, you're gonna be like, who are these characters? Why does this matter? But they are. There's are also lots of new faces and people that are introduced. When you play through this, it explains why people are mad at each other because you didn't know that even in the last game. So like that's hmm. the point of this game is kind of exploring um, a new set of people people's concerns. But there's like this like kind of heavy maybe one important thing you can get out of a Wikipedia synopsis of the first game that that should be good. Mm, my God, strong pass to Wikipedia synopsis. At the very <laughs> least, like watch cinematics because there's I would say there are a couple moments that you have to experience to like really appreciate. Um, hmm. I was about to spoil it for Damon, but I think you can probably find on YouTube. Like we had, we had this question from a listener one episode about like, you know, would you ever watch a game on YouTube instead of right, right. playing it yourself? I think this is one of those instances where that's appropriate. And if you can find a highlight reel and just kind of skip through to those big story moments and those big like emotional moments, it'll help you appreciate or be more, be able to be more like, um, like critical as a, as a, you know, yeah. critical, uh, editor, writer, whatever. Um, uh, with your opinions um, in two when you're feeling when you're feeling that stuff out too, so yeah, I, I, I would do that if I were you. Into you. the back like three chapters because there is a really famous moment outside of uh, 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 the last area that's really cool, and then like it goes into the stuff that you need to know. So that would be cool. I don't know how you would do that. So maybe you can start watching from the end of there. But... We sh we should have done an in five minutes for the last one. <laughs> Yeah, but even that wouldn't do it justice. Like you need to look up. Maybe we need to do um a, a like a, a quick summarization through. Okay, watch these five scenes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. And yeah. if you don't do any of that, I I because I played this game for a long time. They absolutely recap it. It's just you have to wait a while for that to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you Good are enough. okay. Good to so know. get a previously on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and we, in like several different really cool like video gamey ways. So they they mm -hmm. do a good job of that. Yeah. We got an email that um, is sort of tangentially uh, related to all this. So let's check in with the listeners. Hey, Hello. listeners! Listen, listeners, remember you can always reach us at the email address gamescoop at ign .com, just like Chris in Cardiff, Wales did. And he says, "I've recently been playing my Mega Drive Mini." while my son has been finishing Spider-Man on the PS4. My observation is that games seem to make much more of the story these days than when I was a kid. While the stories told by games such as Spider-Man are very polished, to me, it is at a loss to the gameplay. The games I played on consoles, such as the Mega Drive, had a narrative, but often it made no sense, and I didn't care. However, the gameplay was often excellent. These days, I feel I have to invest in the story being told as it's such a heavy part of the game, or the game becomes a bore. Do you think games are now becoming more like interactive stories rather than video games? And if so, do you think this is the right way the industry should continue to move? I'm like personally so much a fan of storytelling and, and fantasy. Um, so I like that those are now incorporated in a thing I've always enjoyed being like an active participant of. So yeah, like if, if the gameplay has to be key because I'm not going to carry on through a really boring game um, just to see the story out. Like that's when I'd go back the, to the YouTube route uh, in that case. But I think it's nice that we have an evolution of both of those elements. And I think there are games like, like the Batman series, for instance, where you have a bit of both. Like I, I love like the, the graceful choreographed combat. So the gameplay is really solid, but it still felt like here's a development of characters and here are some stories and here are some like moral ambiguities for you to ponder. Like I, I think that stuff adds to the shelf life of a game where if I play a platformer with no storyline and it's like a really solid, concise platforming experience, that's one thing that I'll remember the feelings of in that moment. And maybe, you know, I'm playing with a friend uh, nearby. And so I'm, I have like memories of that experience. But if it's a story that I can dissect and think about later and, and bring as discussions with friends and on podcasts afterwards, um, that's the kind of thing that kind of extends its shelf life for me uh, on a personal mm -hmm. level. I'd yeah. also, 
would also say, because I agree with all that, but I'd also say that, like, I, I don't necessarily know if the the right way to say it is that games are now all about story. I think it's right. that games, like, I don't, I don't think story games have replaced gameplay focused games. I think they're that part of gaming has blossomed a lot bigger than it used to be but there's still plenty of games out there that you can find that are just yep. focused on giving you a really fun time and not really worried about the story like a notable example in my mind is like sea of thieves doesn't really like sure. bog you down with plot it's really just about going out and being on a pirate ship with friends right yeah. so there's i think those still exist it's just that the story games are the ones that you hear a lot about because I think it resonates with a lot of people. And if it doesn't resonate with you, that's totally fine. It's just mm -hmm. like, they're the big budget ones that are getting a lot of kind of publicity a, a lot of the time mm -hmm. because you have famous people in them for some reasons. That's true. It's like triple a level production almost automatically necessitates mocap and like professional right. actors in those scenario in those mocap scenarios. So it's, it's just like the expectation has changed for sure. But something like Carry On, I imagine, won't yeah. have the most in-depth story, um, and that it it will live on and live or die based on its gameplay. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what both of you were saying. I think games have gotten a lot better at telling stories, and there are certain types of games that lean heavily on story. But then, like, there's no shortage of just games that are just pure gameplay today, like Dead Cells, Celeste, Slay the Spire, Mario Kart. You know, this is. Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. They, they, they didn't care about the story in Breath of the Wild. I don't. I know you guys think that that was like a, like there's people out there that are like oh, but you got to wrestle the princess and like yeah, come on. Um, <laughs> that game was about exploration. Uh, I I want uh, something mean about games that uh, is that they just want to be like movies and that's not good enough. Like the games need to be their own thing and they need to like you know figure out what makes it a game like what makes what makes storytelling better. Uh, by the nature of a game being a game. And only a few games figured that out. Portal 2 is the best example I can possibly think of. Mm -hmm. um, there's, But then a, a nice saying something nice, uh, I think it's really cool to employ a bunch of uh, people that are writing and mocap acting and, and, and acting acting. And it's just this giant studio system that's developed for creative people. And like, that's the coolest thing. I think that's so awesome that there's just a million more jobs in writing and making cool stuff. Now that the games have gotten up to the point where we need actors and, and dialogue. Yep. Those are all really good points. And that brings us to video game 20 questions. Our suggestion this week comes from John in Bristol, UK. Let the questioning begin. So not Cardiff, Bristol. Right. Okay. Okay. Is there a prominent story in this game? Oh. <laughs> to keep it relevant? No. Oh, a gameplay game. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it a spooky game? Um, no. No. Okay. I like how you thought about that. What do you think that means, Tom? Uh, I think that people get spooked by all sorts of different things. Um, yeah. I, I so I'm, I'm gonna keep it going on the, the the train of thought. Do you is it is it a violent game? Um, not by today's standards. Okay. Ooh, but okay. Like. Like by the uh, the literal definition of violence, you could find, but nobody would, you know, bat an eye at it. Yeah, okay. that's like how gratuitous it, violence. Right. Yeah, in the in the in the first Mario game in the manual, it says that every <laughs> single brick in the game is a Mushroom Kingdom resident that uh, is turned <laughs> right. into a brick. So you're yeah. just, you know, you're murdering more than Nathan Drake, basically. Right. Um, I think we got an we extra clue in there. Yeah, yeah we did. I think, yeah. So I think it's not Mortal Kombat, at today's standards. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna mm -hmm. go ahead and say, uh, is this is this game from before 1995? Yes. Okay. Um, did this come out on the NES? Yes, that's fine. Hmm. Hmm. Is it a licensed game? Yes. Ooh. Nice, good one. That's great to have. I feel like we normally get a no on that one. <laughs> Doesn't help narrow it down. <laughs> no. Oh, is this a good game? It's okay. <laughs> it's like I, love, a, I love how 20 questions has had two yes or no answers that have been better than yes or no. <laughs> it's like a six in the, in the old days, six and a half or a seven on the IGN scale. You can't just go by the real scale? What do you mean? Like today's scale? <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, 
So license, it could be a Ninja Turtles game. Is this a, mm. a, 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 a based on a, a movie or a cartoon? I don't know. I like narrowing those down sometimes. Um, is this based on a, a movie? Yes. Ooh. <laughs> so yes, movie. Yeah. yeah. And it just so if you guys just think of every action movie that came out in the eighties, <laughs> there's an NES game for it. But that could still be TMNT. It totally could. Um, was this game? Yeah. Uh, is this a sci-fi game? There are sci-fi elements. Still, no yes or no. Mm. But you okay. probably wouldn't like if you're gonna drop it into a, you know, genre category. It probably wouldn't be sci-fi. Okay. Um. Do you play as a human? No. That's ten. That's what I was gonna try to narrow it down. No. I'm gonna be useless here because so, my my knowledge base is SNES in terms of like for sure, but just think of movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably Willow or <laughs> you know something was I don't know. I'm trying to think. There's so many. There's you know the there's just he didn't say it's sci-fi, so that's that's what yeah. makes it interesting. There's like Karate Kid that doesn't really have sci-fi elements. Well, but you're not playing a human, so. That's probably where the questionable mm -hmm. sci-fi element yeah. comes in, if I had to guess. Yeah, yeah, true. Staring at Damon's face to find a reaction. I, would, I, would, <laughs> I only he Howard the Duck into the right? game. What's yeah. that, Tom? ET counts as sci-fi. What does? Who? What? T. E.T.? Oh, E.T. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, e. okay. E.T. didn't come out on NES. Well, it did, actually, recently. It was Wait, recently what? Ported, it was recently ported by a fan oh. uh, or an indie developer. Kevin oh, that's Hammond. really funny. He's a friend of the show. He sent us games to, to play around with before. Um, all right, let's do, uh, do you play as an animal? Yes. A movie where you play as an animal. Was this developed in Japan? Yes. Was it developed by Konami? No. Do you have one in mind? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, I see. So wait, um, it is an animal, though. Yeah, you play as an animal. Okay. Hmm. Based on, and it was a movie for sure, right? Yes. Okay, so not DuckTales, even though there was a DuckTales movie. Yeah. Um, was this developed by Capcom? No. Really? I'm having a hard time thinking of movies featuring animals yeah. that would have also oh, been it's video a, games. This is a kid's game. Uh, I mean, it's an NES oh, sorry, game. Sorry, let me ask this, let me ask this. Was it based <laughs> on a kid's movie? Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a gray area. Hmm. So it couldn't be like Lion King or something. Yeah, that's what it's exactly. like. Certainly a king, a, a kids movie. I'm gonna we're gonna count that question, and I'm gonna say that it's based on uh, a movie that was created a, a problem for some parents that took their kids to the movie. Ooh. That's 15. So it was assumed to be a kids movie. By That's virtue of it being animated, maybe. Yeah, is this an animated movie? No. Oh. Oh. So it might be a scary puppetry movie or something like that. Uh huh. Were there like Gremlins games? Gremlins. Like That's oh, it. That's a good idea. That's it. It's probably Gremlins Two: The Legend of Curly's Gold. <laughs> <laughs> so specific. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the Mind Palace working. No, that, that. <laughs> I was just joking. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Gremlins. You guys got it. So uh, there's a Gremlins <laughs> 2 game, but I don't know if there's a Gremlins 1 game. Is this a sequel? Is what? Is the game a sequel? Is, is the game a sequel? To another game? No. <laughs> this is based on a movie that's a sequel. Yes. Oh, so <laughs> okay. Is this Gremlins 2? Yes. Gremlins wow. 2. Who did play as Tom and Sam? Your Gizmo. Tom got yeah. that, right? You play as Gizmo. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm guess Gremlins, you, you narrowed it down to Gremlins 2. Because I don't think job. there's a Gremlins 1. <laughs> there's not a Gremlins 1 game on NES. So that's like Goonies. There's only oh. a Goonies 2 on NES. Yep. 
I feel like we got yeah. lucky with a lot of like gray area questions there. Yeah. Well, that was, really good, <laughs> that was really cool that we got it down to a movie and then uh, went through 80s movies. That was awesome and got one. Yeah. And then seriously. the Gremlins thing is really funny because I think parents were really freaked out when they took kids to that because there's like some horrible stuff in it, right? Kind yeah. of. It's kind of yeah. a scary uh, movie, actually, if you think about oh, it. Yeah. The original Gremlins, along with a couple of the movies like Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Doom, uh, oh, yeah, in the Temple yeah. of Doom, are mm. why they created the PG-13. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Temple of Doom has the heart rip out. And then Gremlins yeah. has, I mean, among other There's things. There's lots of gore, like, like, com like comical gore stuff. Like they put a Gremlin mm. in the microwave and it explodes. Explodes. Yeah. Things mm. like that. And then there's the horrible Santa Claus story. <laughs> why would they include that? Yeah. Yeah. Phoebe Cates tells a story about how her dad died. That's just like, uh, oh yeah, a pretty, pretty, it would be a pretty sad story for a kid to hear. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the suggestion, John in Bristol, UK. Gremlins 2. Wow. An okay game, six and a half or a seven on the old I hear Legends it's game. good and I don't own it. Yeah. So if anybody has a lead on Gremlins 2, I'd like to play that game. See, if we could have, if we could have gone to PAX West, we probably could have yeah. found a copy. That's what we would have picked up. Yep. But there'll be a digital store, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> digital we'll merch. See. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. All right. Uh, for when we're recording this, we're about 30 minutes out from EA Play. So we're going to go cover that now. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, any fun announcements that come out of that next week. But that is all the scoops that we have for you this week. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. Remember, you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com. My name is Damon. This is IGN Gamescoop. And we're out. <laughs>